Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lectures. Today we're going to discuss the Boltzmann Transport Equation and how its terms affect a system's criticality, and we'll start by discussing the 1958 criticality accident in the Mayak facility. The Mayak Production Association is a Russian plutonium production facility in the southern Ural region. Mayak contains a plutonium reprocessing facility and formerly housed five plutonium production reactors. It was also infamously the site of seven criticality accidents. The first of these accidents took place in 1953, and the second took place in 1957, after which Mayak management decided to run a series of critical experiments to better understand the uncertainties in critical parameters involved with the facility's fissile material operations. These experiments involved performing 1 over M approach to critical experiments with a series of vessels that resemble the vessels involved in the facility's fuel production operations. By the nature of using these vessels for multiple experiments with varying enrichments and fuel concentrations, these experimentation vessels had to be larger than the bare minimum of what was required to obtain criticality. The fissile solution used in these experiments was prepared by other plant personnel, but these experiments were performed by a team of three dedicated, knowledgeable experts. By the end of 1957, this team had finished a series of experiments for determining critical parameters for a set of smaller vessels, and at the beginning of 1958, they were to perform a new series of experiments for larger vessels. As shown here in this diagram, these larger vessels were to be elevated to minimize neutron reflection from the floors, and after the experiment ended, the solution was to be drained into favorable geometry 6-liter bottles. The team began these experiments on January 2, 1958, which was their first day back at work after the New Year holidays. The experiment achieved a critical configuration without any issues, and the team began draining the 418 grams per liter of uranium solution out of the experimentation vessel and into the 6 liter bottles. Filling these bottles was a fairly slow process, and so at some point after filling an unrecorded number of 6 liter bottles, the experimenters decided that the remaining solution was safely subcritical, and concluded that they could pour the rest of the solution out of the container by tipping the vessel onto its side. The container's base was actually bolted to the platform it was resting on to prevent this kind of unsafe behavior, so the experimenters actually unbolted the container from its stand in order to tip it over. Unbolting the container and tipping it over caused the remaining solution, which was spread out over the bottom of the large diameter vessel, to pool into the corner of the vessel. Moving the solution into this more compact shape reduced the surface area of the solution, and thus also reduced its degree of neutron leakage, which provided a massive reactivity insertion. Best estimates predict that the container contained about 22 kilograms of uranium, which was well above the 2 to 8 kilograms of uranium estimated to achieve criticality, as shown in this critical mass curve. In its initial state before being tipped over, the system's eigenvalue was estimated to be about 0.91, which is already alarmingly close to critical. After tipping the container onto its side, calculations from John Miller at Sandia National Laboratories estimated the system's eigenvalue to be 1.17, which represents an enormous $27 reactivity insertion. For reference, the ACRR trigger reactor at Sandia can insert at most somewhere between $3 and $5 worth of reactivity. This system was absurdly supercritical during the accident. After they began tipping over the tank, the three workers witnessed a blue flash, shortly after which the solution from the tank shot out of the tank and hit the ceiling five meters above them. John Miller of Sandia National Laboratories modeled this accident using the Serpent Monte Carlo code and the Open Foam Computational Fluid Dynamics code. As shown in this video, the accident happens almost too quickly to catch, but if you slow things down, you'll notice that the solution's eigenvalue quickly jumps over 1.0 when the accident begins, and that the system stays supercritical until the solution is ejected from the vessel. If you look at the side and top-down views, you'll notice that the solution takes a roughly spherical shape, depending on your point of view. 
This shows how changes to a solution's geometry can easily cause a solution to take a spherical-like shape, and how these changes can insert an absurd amount of reactivity. This prompt supercritical excursion released around 2 times 10 to the 17th fission events and gave the workers a dose somewhere between 30 and 130 grays, which is just an absurd amount of dose. All three workers died 5 to 10 days after the accident from acute radiation syndrome, and they even began to show symptoms of ARS while they were on their way to the hospital. Exhibiting symptoms of ARS that quickly is never a good sign. A fourth worker was standing slightly farther back from the vessel during the accident, and she received approximately 6 gray of dose. She too suffered from acute radiation syndrome, but ended up surviving and partially recovering. In the following years, she continued to suffer from health complications related to the accident, eventually developing cataracts in both eyes and eventually losing her sight. She died 24 years after the accident from lung cancer, and this time frame suggests that the cancer could have been caused by the dose that she received during the accident. Following this accident, management discontinued the critical experiment series at the Mayak facility. The three experimenters involved in this accident were knowledgeable and dedicated, and they really should have known better both because of the knowledge of safety protocols in the facility and because of their understanding of reactor physics. If the experiments in this accident had been more conscious of how the Boltzmann equation's terms can affect a system's eigenvalue, then perhaps they could have avoided this accident altogether. Our old friend, the diffusion approximation to the Boltzmann transport equation, contains four main terms. The neutron linkage term, the neutron absorption term, the neutron production term, and the scattering source term, which can also be thought of as describing neutron moderation effects. If you don't have the Boltzmann transport equation memorized, but would like to memorize these processes, the PALM acronym is actually pretty easy to remember and pretty useful. In nuclear criticality safety, ultimately we want to identify the processes, physics phenomena, or events that can cause a system to go supercritical, and then to devise ways to control these processes. The first step in doing this is to understand how these processes will affect the system's eigenvalue. Increasing a system's neutron production term will increase the system's K effective since it results in more fission events or more neutrons being released per fission. Increasing the absorption or leakage terms results in a loss of reactivity since these mechanisms allow neutrons to be lost either due to absorption or leakage. In the case of the Mayak 1958 accident, the experimenters decreased the system's leakage term by tipping the container onto its side and allowing the urinal nitrate to gather itself into a less leaky, more spherical shape. This loss of leakage caused the $27 reactivity insertion that initiated the prompt supercritical excursion and killed the three operators. Now, things get complicated with the moderation term. Adding more moderation will add reactivity to an under-moderated system, but it will reduce reactivity in an over-moderated system. Moderation effects depend on the system's neutron spectrum and its nuclide composition, so it's difficult to say a priori how changing the moderation term will affect a system's eigenvalue. Our best bet is to apply some engineering intuition and plenty of MCMP simulations. So now that we understand the impact that these terms have on a system's eigenvalue, how can we control them and ensure that a system cannot possibly go supercritical? Understanding how to control the factors that affect a system's reactivity is a key goal of nuclear criticality safety, and something that we will discuss at length in the coming lectures. But for this introduction, I'll briefly describe how to control for the terms in the Boltzmann transport equation. Let's start with the production term. Controlling for the production term generally involves controlling for the amount of fissile isotopes in the system. Technically, we can increase a system's eigenvalue by increasing the new bar parameter, or the average number of fission neutrons released per fission, but in practice, new bar is really a physics-based parameter, 
and it's difficult for an upset condition to increase nu bar significantly in isolation. So in general, we can only increase the production term by increasing the fissile isotope inventory, which in turn increases the system's fission cross-sections. If we want to think about it using critical mass curves, increasing the fissile isotope inventory can move us closer to, and eventually above, the critical mass curve. So how can we control for the fissile isotope inventory? Mass control and volume control are two ways of doing this. Through mass control, we seek to control for the mass of fissile material that can actually fit into an area. For example, if we work in a facility that processes and ships 1.4% enriched uranium dioxide powder, and we know that it's impossible to pack enough 1.4% enriched powder into a 55 gallon drum to reach criticality, then we might choose to limit the size of the containers in the facility to 55 gallon drums to assuage any criticality concerns. Likewise, for volume control, a facility that processes 90% enriched urinal nitrate could guarantee that they always maintain a safe volume of material by limiting the size of the containers in their facility to one gallon or less. Leaving a 5,000 milliliter round bottom boiling flask sitting on the shelf is a recipe for disaster in such a facility. Even if the rules say never to use that container, if you leave that container there long enough, it's perhaps inevitable that someone will end up filling it up with the 90% enriched solution. Therefore, it's better to limit the volume of all containers in the facility to a volume that is safe for that fissile solution's concentration and enrichment. To maintain absorption control, we must guarantee that the system maintains its ability to parasitically capture neutrons. In practice, this means that we need to guarantee that our system maintains some desired concentration of neutron-absorbing poison material. We also need to guarantee that our system's neutron spectrum doesn't shift so that our poison becomes ineffective. For example, a poison that only absorbs fast neutrons could become ineffective if the fire sprinklers suddenly went off and flooded the room with neutron-moderating water. In practice, absorption control is difficult to maintain because you need to continuously verify that the absorber is still there. In some cases, this is easy. For example, if your absorber is a fluid that you can access easily, or whose container you can easily spot when it's empty, then it's fairly easy to maintain absorption control. But in practice, verifying absorption control is quite difficult. For example, boron containing boral plates are placed in spent fuel pools to prevent spent fuel from reaching anything close to a critical configuration. But these plates are surrounded by aluminum cladding, so it's difficult to know if they have decomposed or crumbled down over time. Additionally, the spent fuel and these boro plates are located in a high radiation area, which makes it difficult to inspect them. Because of these difficulties, criticality safety engineers tend to rely on absorption control less frequently than other controls. The best approach for maintaining leakage control depends on the system that we're designing, but in general it relies on controlling for the system's shape, density, separation or spacing, or reflection. Because there are so many factors that could affect leakage, the necessary controls depend on what kind of system you're working with, be it liquid or solid, compressible or incompressible, one assembly or multiple assemblies, and bare or reflected. The Mayak 1958 accident occurred because the experimenters did not control for the shape of the urinal nitrate at the bottom of their experimentation vessel. They allowed it to move from being spread out over the large bottom of the vessel to being concentrated into the corner of the vessel. Large diameter vessels like this have a notorious potential for dangerous upset conditions, since tipping the container over slightly will cause a solution to flow rapidly into a more compact shape in the corner of the vessel. Thus, large diameter vessels like this should always be regarded with suspicion and should be handled with care. Other examples of a loss of leakage control include accidentally replacing a wall with a more dense material, thus providing more neutron reflection to the system, or a rack containing ingots of fissile material accidentally falling over, thus allowing the ingots to spill onto ingots from another rack. Or lastly, a person reflecting neutrons by standing too close to a bare sphere of fissile material. 
there are plenty of ways to accidentally lower the rate of neutron leakage from a system, so the best approach for achieving leakage control really depends on the system that we're dealing with. However, it is worth mentioning an often overlooked fact about neutron reflectors, which is that any material can act as a neutron reflector to some degree. Even if the material has an enormous neutron absorption cross-section, it will still have some non-zero neutron scattering cross-section, and thus, it can reflect neutrons back into the system. The only material that is a true perfect absorber is actually vacuum. Once neutrons leak into vacuum, they will be gone forever because the density of vacuum, and thus its neutron scattering cross-section, are actually equal to zero. These Monte Carlo simulations model the Godiva critical assembly, which is a bare sphere of highly enriched uranium, either with vacuum boundary conditions or reflected by a thick boron-10 reflector. Boron-10 is an outstanding neutron absorber, but it's still nowhere as good of an absorber as vacuum. Because of this, the boron-10 reflected sphere had an eigenvalue that was an outrageous $15 higher than the vacuum reflected sphere. So in summary, any material can act as a neutron reflector, even materials that you would least suspect to reflect neutrons. Now before we move on to moderation control, it's worth mentioning a concept known as buckling conversion. From diffusion theory, we know that a system will be critical if its geometric buckling equals its material buckling, where the material buckling describes how reactive that material is, and the geometric buckling describes how leaky that specific geometric configuration is. If the geometric buckling is larger than the material buckling, then the system will be subcritical, and if the material buckling is larger, then the system will be supercritical. Now, because the material buckling depends only on the material and its cross-sections, and not on the shape of the material, two different shapes that are made of the same material will have the same geometric buckling if they are both in a critical configuration. So by equating the two geometric bucklings, we can use the known critical dimensions for one shape to estimate the critical dimensions for another shape if it is comprised of the same material and if both systems are bare, unreflected geometries. This method is handy, for example, when using critical mass curves, which are usually given for a spherical shape. With buckling conversion, we can convert the critical mass for spherical shapes into a critical mass for other shapes. I should note that this method is approximate, so one should apply it with caution. This method is based on the diffusion approximation, which can yield very inaccurate results in certain circumstances, especially if we neglect for this diffusion extrapolation distance, d. Nonetheless, if you're caught in an emergency situation where, for example, you need to quickly move liquid from one container into another container, then this buckling conversion method can quickly convert critical dimensions from one shape into another shape, albeit approximately. Lastly, we must contend with moderation control. Moderation control is difficult because it involves too many competing effects and too many system-dependent limits. Moderation control might not be necessary for an over-moderated system, where adding more moderator will drive the system to be more subcritical, but it would be absolutely essential for an under-moderated system. Most criticality safety applications involve under-moderated configurations, especially for dealing with highly enriched uranium, so in general, we must control for the degree of moderation that is allowed in our system. This lecture has introduced some general ideas for controlling for sources of reactivity in a system containing fissile material. But mostly, the purpose of this lecture is to get you thinking about how different upset conditions can, through the parts of the Boltzmann transport equation, add reactivity to a system. In the coming lectures, we'll discuss a much more thorough approach for identifying and protecting against potential upset conditions.